Let's talk about gender. Let's talk about being intelligent about gender. People are intelligent about different things. We know that we have numeracy intelligence, literacy intelligence. Some people are emotionally intelligent, some people aren't. But the point is, we can become intelligent. We need to be more intelligent about gender within everyday settings and across wider society. Gender is complex, but we need to complicate the picture of gender. Because by oversimplifying gender, this doesn't just lead to stereotyping, but it's, it reduces us. It restricts everybody within everyday settings. So I am a trans person. I identify as trans, transgender. I was assigned female at birth, and now I live as a man. And when I say the word trans, what I mean by that is that it describes those whose assigned sex at birth does not match or sit easily with a sense of self. And I think people who identify as trans have got a lot to say about gender and a huge amount to contribute to complicating the picture of gender. As some people may know the acronym LGBT. It stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. And these words have been really important to us. They describe us and they tell people who we are. It, they legitimize us. But the problem is the acronym is growing. We now no longer just have LGBT. We have LGBT, QQ, IA, and there are more coming through. So I think this model is it's no longer tenable. We have to rethink the structure of gender identity and sexual orientation. Just to take an example, we are living on the cusp of a gender revolution. If you go to Facebook now into your profile settings, you can choose your gender identity from up to 72 words to describe how you identify your gender. So the multiplicity of words that we're using is ever more increasing. On the flip side of that, it's really important to emphasize the fact that it is only legally possible to be in this country and other countries, but not every country, it is only legally possible to be male or female. And the assigned sex is made at birth based on the visual, physical sex characteristic, which is genitalia. And that's it. Okay? So our legal sex or gender identity of being male or female is based on genitalia. And that's it. It's absurd. But one of the things, one of the questions I have is why perhaps the gender binary, the idea of being only male or female, continues. And I think it's something to do with the comfort zone of essentialism. Okay. Um, and this idea of essentialism is, uh, dates back to Plato. And Plato said, an essence characterizes a substance or a form. It is permanent, unalterable and eternal. And this idea is very comforting to us that there is something in there, there is something is permanent and unalterable about who we are as individuals. And also, this idea, I think, links to another expression which is called biological determinism. And biological determinism 
um, uses this idea of essentialism, basically says your essence, who you are, is determined in your biology. It's already in there at the point of birth. And even uh, within LGBT circles, this argument is also made. The idea that you know, we are LGBT, we are trans, and that is always in there, that is innate. And therefore, it is not our fault that we're trans. We didn't choose to be trans, and therefore, we should be treated equally. And I think that has given us some rights within our society recently. But here's the thing. Our human rights should not be based upon that which is biologically determined. Our human rights should be based on the idea of pursuing that which we wish to become. It's about the freedom to act that is important in terms of uh, gaining our human rights, gaining equality in society. And it's this idea of becoming what it is that we wish to become that I uh, have found incredibly empowering and really useful in thinking about my own gender identity and the work that we do. So I'm just going to flag up three theorists. And the first one is Simone de Beauvoir. Um, and she famously said, all the feminists are going, yes, yeah, Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> <laughs> she famously said, one is not born a woman, but rather one becomes a woman. And we can kind of know this, because when we look at a baby, we don't think there's a woman, there's a man. We think there's a baby. Unless, of course, you're talking about trans people. <laughs> one thing I think is a bit of a bugbear, so I'm going to share it with you all today <laughs> while I've got the chance. When people talk about trans people, certainly on the telly, they may say, say for example, they were talking about me, they'd say, Jay Stewart, born a woman. And I don't think I could check with my parents that anyone went up to them and said, Mr. and Mrs. Stewart, Mr. And Mrs. Stewart congratulations on your lovely little woman. <laughs> you know, it doesn't quite figure. One is not born a woman, rather one becomes a woman. Or not, in my case. <laughs> okay, and that is what I think is so intriguing, that actually gender is more complicated than that. The other great thinker that has been used for is Nietzsche, and he said, there is no doer behind the doing. So this is a little bit more difficult to comprehend and certainly put into place within everyday life. But if I was to say to you, I'm walking across the stage, you're not allowed to walk too far, you can only walk within this. <laughs> um, but I'm walking, rather than say, I, who is already here, I'm going about walking. The walking, through the act of walking, produces me as a person, as an I. So it is through the action that we become who we are. And this idea was taken by um, one of the greatest think thinkers within gender theory, Judith Butler, who said there is no gender identity behind the expression of gender. So rather than I am already a gender that goes on to express that gender, the expression produces me as a gendered person. And in this, this is really, I think, interesting because we need to move away from a classification or a categorization of gender and into a space that allows for us to describe our gender expression, like a tagging system, so that we can take on tags, useful words, that describe those expressions, and we can have as many tags as we want, and we can take them off when they are proving to be less useful, rather than then be there fixed and permanent and firmed up. Because if we hold on to becoming our gender, if we hold on to this idea of expressing gender more centrally within our everyday life, we can pay closer attention to the systems of power at play. Okay, because the possibilities of expression, they're political. So who gets to express themselves in a particular way 
is political. There continues to be enormous restrictions on everybody with regards to how they express themselves. Who gets to be a nurse? Who gets to be a politician? Who gets to wear a dress? Who gets to earn more money? Who gets to cry? What is allowed and what is not allowed is a matter of politics. This isn't just about stereotyping. This is about reducing people to the sex that they were assigned at birth. This is about reducing people and restricting people based on their genitalia. Okay, it's absurd, and it's oppressive, and it's dangerous. We need to move away from a model of biological determinism, away from saying, you know, it is innate, um, I didn't choose to be trans. It's not about choosing or not choosing. This is about agency. This is about being able to make choices and express ourselves. And also, when it feels kind of wrong, when we get that sense that something is not allowed, but we would like to express it in a certain way, we need to perceive those moments as political, and we need to challenge them. We need to, each of us, become more intelligent about gender. Thinking, reading, reflecting, discussing, having chats in the pub over breakfast. We need to be critical by the things that we see around us, and we need to challenge one another. We need to challenge the teachers in our classrooms, our co-workers, and our peers, because this wouldn't just benefit people like myself, but it would benefit everybody. Thank you.